It's the same one. And then you put the sugar. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the I will give you this one then. But this is tea. Yeah, this is tea. You, you want, want coffee? coffee? Yes, please. I'll get you coffee. No, no, I'll have this. Not Sorry. a problem? No, no, of course not. So it's all right now? You're set? Yes. Wow, I should take a photograph of this. Yes, definitely. <laughs> a frugal design for frugal dialogue. Exactly. Isn't that it? Yep. That's, That's exactly. very nice. That's very nice. I will tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> You don't mind? No. The professional reputation would not suffer because. Of no, that. of course not. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm very happy with the way my documentary is. Unfolding. Yes, because uh, sometimes, you know, this is a very interesting point to begin our conversation on. Shall we begin? Yes, please. Uh, one of the terms that you must have noticed I never use is what is called a jigar. This is a jigar, a makeshift solution. If you decided to rest with such solutions forever, you're never going to be a great filmmaker. True? That is my point. Our people are resourceful. They can find a way through problems and get over the hump when the problem arises, move with their life. But when next time problem arises, they again do the same thing. And that's not right. So the kind of camera you mentioned you left in Pune, which you feel would have been much better, is a systematic invention to address a particular problem of documenting the conversations or dialogue. Why didn't it happen here? Because we kept on getting over the problem and finding uh, the easy way around that. So, Jugaad mindset is not something that I will advise anyone, anywhere in the world. Any company which tries to follow Jugaad mindset will never find a solution that our space program did, which is very frugal, but very systematic. A solid science and technology behind it. They did not cut corners, they did not make a makeshift solution. The solution they have developed works for 100 satellites in a single launch. Nobody else could do that. So naturally, the effort that our grassroots innovators put for a long period of time may not be borne out by a formal training because they don't have one. But through their empirical experience of solving problems, they are able to persist with an approach which more often than not generates a solution. That solution sustains. The question that, why do they spend their lifetime solving a problem, my answer is passion. There is an innovator, Natubhai, who has spent about 16 years, 25 lakh of rupees of his own, plus whatever it will be, supported him in finding a device, a machine, which will pluck cotton balls. The Dalian cotton variety, unlike hybrid cotton, the balls don't open. So you have to pluck the balls from the plant and then separate the shell and take the cotton out. He has been working for almost 6, 13, 14, 15 years because he believes that this problem can be solved. He has made a temporary sol a, a interim solution which works but is not so good. He wants to improve it. And he has tried so many different ways that didn't work to find a way that worked. We are now supporting him to find an answer. I wouldn't say that the problem he has chosen is not relevant, it's extremely relevant. A lot of child labor gets into that operation. I will also not say that if there was a better training, he would have solved it faster because all the agriculture engineers of our country knew about the problem and did nothing about it. So if training was a driver, a good science and technology training was a driver of solving problems, then so many problems of our society, which grassroots innovators solve, would not have remained unsolved. So naturally, training by itself is useful, but not necessarily a support. It sometimes blinds our eyes to those solutions which our society needs, but which may not be very fashionable or may not get them a good publication. So when we started looking for these innovations, 
and solutions that people have developed through their own genius around the country for last, over the last 30 years. Initially, people didn't believe that that would be so. But now we have walked through every part of the country. You know, we have this show, the Atla Learning Walks. Summer, we go to hot places. Winter, we go to cold places. And the reason is very simple. When you go in Odisha, we had last show, the Atla we had in Barpali in summer, 49 degrees centigrade temperature. You, people don't ask why have you come. They understand you are crazy. When they don't start out in the daytime from their houses because of so much of heat, somebody keeps walking during that time to reach their place, to talk to them, it must be crazy. But that craziness gives us a very good head start. We don't have to prove our authenticity. Our method becomes a means of conveying our purpose. So the process that dictates our purpose and immediately we get into discussion and then so many insights are shared. So there is certainly a way in which people find affordable stream refugal solutions. Even if you think of it from the common sense point of view, what are they constrained in? The people at the, in the villages, in the slums, they are constrained in material inputs. What they are abundant in? Knowledge inputs. What would they then try to save? Materials. What would that try to leverage knowledge? So it is not for nothing that frugal innovation maximize knowledge, minimize materials, by and large. They also require, very often at the grassroots level at least, second-hand components. Now, circular economy is becoming popular now. Our the donut people, economy. Our people knew it for ages. A car becomes unfit for road maybe in 15 years, but the axle will last for 40 years. The steering will, will last for 100 years. Nothing happens to that. Today you junk everything. That means they unutilized energy in steering wheel, in axle, in differential, in gearbox. All of that is wasted. Not in our country. Our farmers will use every jowl of energy, every ounce that is available in that part till it ceases to be of any significant use by repurposing it, by redesigning it. And that is a dictum of circular economy. So this is a new discovery for the European society. For us, it has always been the part of our life. We were not a waste-oriented society. We tried to use things over and over again. So I would say that it is this reason which might have made the multinational company very intrigued about what we do be it Cisco, be it HP, be it uh, Bristol Myers, be it uh, Siemens, you name the companies, GE, Volvo, why are they keen to learn about this? Because they think they have made something. They have made acquisite products, excellent products, a lot of robustness, otherwise they won't work on our roads and our conditions. But maybe the affordability frontier could be still achieved. They could reach many more millions who are earning a few dollars a day. And they want to understand that. How does it happen? How do you think when you try to develop solutions which are extremely affordable, but often are reasonably accurate? You don't have to make a trade-off between accuracy and affordability. If I'm giving you a herbal medicine for solving your problem, it may take time, but it will not make other parts of your body sick. It will not be less accurate in terms of its effectiveness. It may, it may take time, which is true for most alternative therapies, which is true for Ayurvedic medicine. It takes time. So, we need not have to make trade-off between accuracy and affordability, between accessibility and availability, which is a function of supply chain. If you have a store or a health center which is very close by, I can walk there, which is accessible. But if there is a stock out, medicine is not there, then it's not available. I need to have accessibility and availability and affordability. These are necessary part of supply chain which guide our people to develop these solutions. Big companies understand this. They try to now understand, in fact, very interesting, that are there parts, are there things that users can do themselves? 
why did so many apps came up on Android platform because it was open source and anybody could play at that in that playground innovation playground and market would judge so cost of entry and cost of exit was very low you just had to upload it stayed there for a few hours or days if people found it useful it was downloaded it just stayed longer if nobody downloaded it for a few days it disappeared which means that there is a merit in using platform technologies which are open access which are with, on which people can then use their creativity and develop further a lot of farm machinery involved that kind of innovation when mansubai jagani in 1992 developed a motorcycle based flying machine which has been patented in us and in india and 200 other fabricators made derivative innovations in that what did they use they used the basic platform a multi purpose tool bar on which you can attach 15 different kinds of implements a bar with holes to fix different in a different distance very flexible companies didn't understand this they used to make a coulter or a harrow or a disc plow with everything fixed almost they thought this is a wonderful platform on which you can affix so many different devices at whatever distance you want at whatever angle you want holes are all around the pipe so this much versatility of cross innovations and then you have to attach to earlier to motorcycle now you can attach to a chassis if you want to increase the torque what should you do reduce the speed so from 3000 rpms of the engine you bring it to 1200 rpm revolution per minute speed goes down torque increases now it can pull the plow in the soil good science good engineering except that this fellow did not learn it in a college or a workshop he learned it the, as dr mushir professor said laboratory of life this is what they love want to learn why indian corporation are not as keen i'm very sorry to say that now that i'm very happy about it because uh, one would wish they were as keen but perhaps they are into me to culture somebody has developed some solution we have developed an analog of that somebody did airbnb we do some others aggregator somebody does amazon we do it i'm not denying that they have solved a purpose they generated job they given very interesting uh, distributed inventory model which amazon had its own warehouses we got them and all that is good but it's not new it's not novel it is not disruptive in that sense you are only using arbitrage of cost that's it so is it possible that indian companies when they start inventing new things they may come down but today they are not today they are not as keen as i think they ought to be what about indian science and technology i would say that the record of scientists is little better now than it was say 10 years ago first 20 years i must say that our ratio of validation value addition was very very low not even 1% technologies would get validated and validated validated by the institutional scientist in the first 20 years we had a small lab whatever we could do with it and some friends could do whatever with it institutionally there was no mechanism we signed an agreement first with csir when dr mushirkar was directed in 2004 then with indian council of medical research 2006 then with indian council of agriculture research which happened recently so all the three councils national innovation foundation part of the hanibi network is a part of it but that is not the way we get most science done it is largely through the social capital of the hanibi network scientists who individually feels motivated to contribute to society say all right this is a good idea you don't have to pay for my fees just pay for my research staff or fellowship to the student consumables and i will do that so our average cost of validation is 1 tenth almost of what it would be if state or market had to be at the cost for patents we filed more than 900 patents on plant variety protection our average cost is around 300 dollars 
Easily it will take at least $3,000, if not $5,000, $10,000. Why? Because no lawyer charges for their time. Why not? They think this is a nation building task, this is a task where knowledge rich, economically poor people are being held. Let us also make a contribution. But I have a question regarding this. There have also been voices from the government saying that because this is going on, because the NIF exists, because they come up with their own solutions, there should not be any increase or any, you know, um, you know, any more attention uh, spent on education in the rural areas in India. What that's, do you think that's about that? That's absurd. That is absurd. That's absurd? Absolutely absurd. I have no hesitation in saying this because some of the innovators who had access to better materials, better skills, have done much better. They have used planetary gears, they have used other models that normal mechanic would not use. They can talk about plasma coating for keeping good quality welding and whatever else. There are very few. But that proves that if you provide education, they will do better, not worse. So this argument that there can ever be any case against education for improving quality of life of people, I can't imagine, I can't understand. No, never. It is true, however, that a lot of people who got good education did not stay in rural area. That is true. But these are two different problems. Those who are staying, you give them education and they will stay there and solve problems better. But we have also started organizing summer school where we bring students from all over the country, give them unmet needs as a challenge. In 21 days last year, 45 students made 12 prototypes of problem that we scientists have known all these years. They knew that for plucking castor, which has thorns on the fruit, gloves are not as effective for cutting the inflorescence. These kids developed a very nice low-cost solution. For repelling the wildlife, you need to have a device which will rotate the light to repel them, but if they do come close, it will sense their presence through a sensor and then produce sound of the predator so that they can be repelled. Why was this device not developed? People use electrical fences that can hurt animals. We don't want animals to be hurt. We have no enmity with them. They're coming because they're hungry. We needed to provide better food for them in the forest, which we did not, or in other lands. So they're coming. So we have we understand their need. But a small farmer can't afford to sacrifice his small farm for meeting their needs. So he's saying, please go away somewhere else without hurting them. Large number of such solutions are required. Large number of such solutions. A salt worker goes into the well where the brine water has to be taken out. There are some gases which are coming out, hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide. If the worker does not come out fast, he dies. Every year, many deaths take place. We needed to develop a simple sensor which you keep on the well and it will tell you whether sulfide gas is coming out or not. So either you don't enter or if it's coming out, come out quickly. Not a big deal, simple chemistry. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. So there are a large number of unmet needs still, which have remained unaddressed by the institutional scientific system. With due respect to them, maybe they were so occupied working with industry or they were so occupied in top-driven, top-down agenda that they didn't get enough time to spend with the community. I have walked everywhere, every part of the country, every single state. Now we have begun the second round of the country. And we can see these problems from very close spot. Therefore, we are able to pose. Now, today we started a biotechnological innovation ignition school today. There are 40 plus students from all over the country, Guwahati, Tamil Nadu, Kashmir, everywhere. And these students are going to work on validating and evaluating in people's knowledge. Somebody has developed a solution for diarrhea, somebody for diabetes, somebody for eczema, somebody for uh, pest control. These kids will work and try to see whether they can become more effective and be translated into do-it-yourself solution so that people can make it themselves. 
a Gandhian vision of decentralized, diversified enterprises. So it is not that the good science is not being produced. These students are here because somebody has taught them well. We have selected these students from all over the country. So surely there are good institutions, there have been good education. What is connection? What is missing is the connection between problem that must be solved versus problems that are interesting to solve. Many times interesting problems are not urgent problems. Or urgent problems don't become interesting problems. You know? So that is the disconnect, slight disconnect. Many times our peer pressure is to do research which many other people around the world are doing so that it gets published easily. Surely you will get a recognition as a scholar but society would not get solution to its problem. So we can publish well by doing well. There is no contradiction between doing good science and good publication. You can still do socially useful technologies and also at the same time find uh, channels for publishing that result. So I don't know whether education is the problem. We need good education, otherwise we won't get these students. We need good education so that our innovators use new materials. Their material they are using for fabricating solutions are 50 year old. They do not, they can, they have a distillation apparatus for making wine or liquor, but they don't use the same apparatus for making herbal extract. A simple little bit of science has to be added to that. A fractional distillation. And from the same biomass, they can get 15 compound or 20 compound rather than just the alcohol which they distillate. Distillate. So the difference between what they're doing and what they ought to be doing is not too far, too much. But the solutions, the implement, the devices for making that leap of value addition has to take place. How do you think um, ethics come into place when, um, when trying to invoke or incite um, the, you know, the, the effective use of social capital in India? Because personally, I have a, you know, I've been under the impression that the young Indian generation is more aware than people would give them credit for, and uh, you know, more and more Indians are also coming back from foreign uh, education experiences or you know internships. They come back. Um, how do you think you can kind of attribute? problems to everyone or to attribute ethics um, or allocate ethics to certain type of people or startups or in order to get those things? Uh, this is a painful question because when we started Honeybee Network, we started with an ethical dilemma. You started with? Ethical dilemma. The dilemma was that we were collecting knowledge from people, we were adding value, we were becoming famous, we were getting on radio, we were getting consultancies, we were getting income. But much of it was not going back to people whose knowledge made it possible. And I thought I was no better an exploiter than a landlord or a money lender or somebody else. And that's how the notion of money became. It does cross-pollination, they don't keep all the honey with themselves, they share some with us. And we thought, why couldn't we then ensure that whatever we learn from people goes back to them in their language. Now, it is this question where we have failed to persuade majority of the formal scientific system that every single student, every single research study that draws upon knowledge and other resources from people, must feel responsible to share the findings in local language in, in an easily comprehensible manner with the people from whom they take the knowledge. First principle. Second, they must be given acknowledgement. Not just to those who solve problems, but even those who helped us to discover the problem solvers, the scouts. And third, that if we develop any benefit and generate any wealth, a share should go back to them. Simple point. But can I say that in the last 30 years I have uh, persuaded three scientific associations or bodies or I or research council, whether in US, 
National Academy of Sciences or USSR or England or in India, which will require this as a code of conduct for every scientist, natural or social, to obey this guideline. Now, it should be so, isn't it? But it has not happened so far. Why not? I think people have thought that the extractive way of dealing with society is all right. What they believe is that when we create public goods at some stage, that's a good enough compensation. So they look at macro accountability, not micro level accountability. But both are different. It's a case of ecological fallacy. Ecological fallacy is when a relationship at one level does not apply at another level. Because you have shared, you develop a satellite which does remote sensing and therefore gives some solution to the problem that society is facing. Doesn't mean that when you develop a sensor or develop a how a society at grassroots level, using the knowledge of people, you should not tell them what you did with their knowledge that they gave. It does not cancel out the obligation at the macro level, whatever good you may have done at the macro level. So I would say that this is one area where I hope in my lifetime this will happen. We will have rules changed in all scientific bodies where accountability knowledge provider will be supreme where sharing of knowledge and value added to that knowledge obtained from society will become a good way of doing science. The reason is that when I share back the knowledge and the findings, people say, oh, is that why you were asking this question? Now I know why you were asking. I'll tell you something more. And this something more that they tell will not come about unless we share what we did with the knowledge they provide. So also, the reward that we get from that knowledge, all kinds of reward, as I said, consultancy, even per day. I go somewhere, I get $250 per day, I spend about $25, just is my saving. What is it? Why did I get the invitation? I got the invitation because I was going to tell a story of our innovators. Then does that money belong to me? No. It should go back to the institution, Sashti or an IF as the case may be, and they should use it for helping other innovators. So, it's a tough thing. It requires accountability of very high order. I'm not saying other people are not accountable. I'm not passing judgment on anybody's moral. I'm only saying that maybe we can do better. I agree with you that a lot of startups are much more responsible today than before. I hope that they will realize this aspect of knowledge economy knowledge exchange between formal and informal system and fertilize the ground from which ideas emerge. So they will get more ideas and in the process there will be trust. So I always say that open innovation system must be reciprocal, responsible and respectful. We should respect the, each other's role. There's a role that scientists have to play, there's a role that farmers or leaders have to play. There's a role we have to share both. People should also share their knowledge, we should also share our knowledge. And we should be responsible. Which also means that sometimes there are practices that people use which are not sustainable. I will not share them. For instance, some fishermen and women use dynamite to catch the fish. I hope anybody who sees this film will not practice it. I request that it not be captured because it kills small fish and the big fish alive. The reproductive cycle of the fish will be disturbed. It's a creative act, but not a sustainable act. What happens? Because if the small fish also get, gets killed, then your reproductive cycle will be disturbed, the fish population will go down. So you should only harvest bigger fish and not smaller fish. So there are many times people do things that may not be long lasting or may not generate, may not help the system to renew itself. And we should never propagate those things. We don't do that. So I'm not saying everything people do is right. We should be skeptical. Like all of us, anybody can be fallible, anybody can do things in the short term, anybody can try to maximize return in the short time period by following non sustainable practices. For instance, people have used compressed air to extract water from underground 
which otherwise would have required a submersible pump. Submersible pump requires electricity. If you don't have electricity and you have to get water from deep down layers of groundwater, then you pump compressed air below and that air to come push the water through another pipe and you extract water from lower depth. Now naturally, if we draw water from very low depth, which we have been doing in this country, vertebrae will go down and those people who can't use such technologies will become dry farmers. Plus, future generation will not follow us. So uh, water mining using fossil water, water that was stored when the earth was formed, which is not replenishable, which is not rechargeable, is a crime. It's a crime against humanity, crime against nature, crime against future generation. And surely that is not something that we should encourage. But people are doing it. So I'm saying that I don't want to romanticize that all grassroots solutions are good. Some of them are not so good. And we should not encourage them. Let us accept it. And I will go now to a very awful example. Uh, our gender issue is very adverse. A thousand male in many developed regions, we have only 850, 60 women, female. There's a whole lot of ways in which people try to do that. Something I don't want to talk about, something aberrant, inhuman, unethical. And we won't talk about it because I don't want to give ideas to others. But the fact is that the ratio has been disturbed because of something that some people in the villages are doing. So I'm very particular, I'm very clear, very unambiguous that we should be skeptic and we should use our judgment of right and wrong as carefully as we can and not romanticize that anything and everything that people do is right, everything and anything that institutional science does is wrong. No, no, no. Mistakes happen on both sides and good things are happening on both sides and we should be, we should uh, recognize and respect them. Could we go to the moment that you first started to walk across the country, to the moment where you started to actually recognize the sustainable uh, innovations that you witnessed. So could, how did that transition go up? How did it go from maybe a, a hobby for you or a certain type of calling to something that's as substantial as, let's say, the right side of the moral coin uh, making these last 30 years completely worthwhile. How did that go? I would say that uh, slowly and slowly I have worked with now the fourth president of our country. I have worked with Dr. Kalam, Mrs. Patel, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, and now Sri Ramnath Kovind. By and large, everybody gave it a push and felt that what we were trying to do was a very meaningful exercise. They met such people from the ground who they never came across in their normal life. They met prime ministers and presidents of the world around, they met top policy makers, they met the prime minister, they met everybody else. But when would they meet such people? So I was fulfilling a need, which I would say every conscientious leader of the country anywhere in the world would have. But the system did not make it possible for them. I will introduce them to children, young children, who were so creative and empathetic, for want of a better word, that made them feel very proud about future, that if there are such children, our country's future is safe, the world's future is safe. So I think partly the fact that we had no other agenda of our own, we had nothing to get. There was nothing we were seeking except recognition for the people who were creative and empirically so. We were showing, we were having exhibitions, we were showing their solutions. It was all visible. It was not here say. It is not a one person's claim versus another person's claim. You can see them working. So that evidence, the moral weight of the empirical evidence, I think made it credible more and more. And at least the head of the state felt a need to continue this support. 
in addition to that, I would say that uh, scientists also realize that they, in the evening of their life, they ask themselves, uh, what did they do which made a difference to the lives of somebody? And when they ask that question, they could not just say, I have published five kilograms of worth of papers or 500 publications, which is good, which is necessary. Without that, the scientific enterprise will not run. So I, one should not minimize the role of publications. It's very important, very, very important. A lot of people discover our work only through publications. How would they know? How would you know our work if we didn't publish or share our work? So it's very important, but not sufficient. It is necessary, but not sufficient. I, it can get both of us to meet, and through you, maybe more people who would like to uh, strengthen similar networks all over the world. It might motivate people to do something better than what we have done in this country. But still a need will remain that those who are doing it already, how do we recognize them? George Washington Carver in US during the days of slave labor made a chariot and he put books on them and went from one farm to another to teach black farm laborers in California. This scientist produced about 200 products from groundnut, all out of patent. He was the inventor of peanut butter, all right, which gave, which increased the income of the farmers who hired those black, black workers. He was not solving problems only of the workers. He accepted a job in a small college at $250 per month as against the job that he was getting a few thousand dollars per month. He was a scientist who was dedicated to produce good science, good technologies, and at the same time work for his fellow kind people who had, did not have the opportunity of study, which he got, by going from farm to farm, teaching the black people. So it is not that what we are doing is very extraordinary. There are people who have done that before us. And there are people who are doing this everywhere in the world. I don't want to claim that what we have done is very extraordinary. However, the only distinction probably that our network can claim a little bit is that we did not focus on only problems that people face. We focused on solutions they produce. It is this potential which is very, which, which augments the self-respect of people and gives them a hope that, okay, if society doesn't care, we can do something ourselves. A very self-reliant spirit gets cemented. And I would wish that most countries, particularly developing countries in the world, must realize this. China is, we have the strongest network of Honeybee Network in China. Why did they feel the importance of it? They had done a great job on other fronts. This was missing. We restored it. We have got 6,000 innovation, thanks to Jan Liang and other professors at Tianzhou University of Finance and Economics, which they have shared with us from 30 provinces of China. So I have more information on grassroots innovation in China than many Chinese have. And we share it with our people. So what I'm trying to say is that it is very important to realize that wherever we have reached today, it happened because of uh, a ratio of sharing to scouting being maintained. I always tell that the modern generation has very high download ratio to upload. And yeah, what do you think about that? Do you? Uh... Do you think that you know the increasing transparency and open source and you know the the cloud and the connectivity uh, being provided in the rural areas, combined with institutions like this one, can you know increase productivity and can actually accelerate the innovation of India? It can, provided the local languages get due importance, which they are not getting provided that we begin from the first step, which is primary schools, and strengthen the quality of education and libraries there. I mean, the schools that we have visited during our walks around the country don't have libraries, don't have labs. Many don't have even playgrounds. So basic needs of a child to become inquiring mind are not fulfilled there. So we are producing two classes of citizens one who studied in government schools 
and they are the, they are the ones where the dropout rate is highest and they become the great labor and the which studies in private school and goes to big institutions and rule on this over this country this is not good so i don't know why itself whether 4g will help in getting more creativity because as i said when i go to colleges and i ask people how much did you download how much did you upload most people look down and feel very embarrassed because they have not uploaded their own knowledge their own ideas they have downloaded from around the world so we are becoming a consuming society india is becoming a knowledge consuming society we are not known as knowledge producing society this country's download to upload ratio is awful can i tell you one thing the download and upload ratio speed is also there so uploading is about 15 times or 20 times slower than download speed this is what companies do why because they don't they want to make it easier for people to consume they make money on consumption not on uploading so this is unfortunate but we are falling prey to that our regulatory policies should not make it possible for people to change these speeds our educational system must insist we made a database called as techpedia.sachi.org it has information of 2000 200000 engineering projects done by 500000 students of our country you will not find projects of stanford and mit student at one place but you will find 200000 project information from all different institutions in the country at one place because we didn't want our students to do what has been done before we wanted originality to increase we wanted our small scale industry to know what our students are working on so they could contact them or their guides and get their problems solved we wanted to make those connections so we built this open source database the largest database of its kind all databases that we have built ironically enough are the largest of their kind in open source but i don't understand what happens to the billions of dollars that other foundations spend and can't create even one more database of open source why if we want to help people to solve their problem themselves shouldn't they have access to the open source database is common sense in every field of knowledge but why are they not doing it i don't understand gates foundation of the world and the welcome trust of the world they have billions of dollars to invest they will invest in circulating solutions but why don't they so they create capacity for people to develop their own solutions so i think there is something wrong in the way we are prioritizing our investments and i am a great believer that there is a there is no monopoly that india has on certain solutions every country has it i have seen from china and india two civilizational societies almost one third of the humanity there are many innovations that have developed in china and in india sometimes chinese are smarter sometimes indians are smarter sometimes they develop the same solution thousand miles away same problem same solution or similar solution so i think there's a great deal of effort that we can save of the world if they can learn from each other faster better and more easily without much transaction cost and that cannot happen if you charge for every sharing of knowledge if you make it difficult languages open access and ability to interpret the annotate the knowledge so that people who, who are not trained in the discipline can use it so that small scale entrepreneurs can use it i think very important for future if you ask me one of our goal is that we have done well in discovering creativity we have not done so well in sharing it in all the indian languages so far we didn't have resources to translate it but i'm trying to persuade young students who come to us okay translate in your language at least 10 times so that i will have that much of knowledge available in 15 to 20 languages that we are trying but it will take long time and i wish the government would realize it the education minister would realize it the prime minister would realize it that if we really want to fertilize the imagination of our people billions and billions of people more than a billion then they must know what is being done and they must do better once i was walking through purulia in west bengal 
there was a village where we found some beautiful terracotta horses lying under a tree. So we asked the porters of the village, why did you keep such beautiful horses? Somebody can take them, somebody can break them. You have kept them in Hopal. They said, sir, you have done a mistake. I said, what mistake have I done? By the time they knew that I was a professor. The professor, we have not kept the most beautiful one. We have kept the best ones. Oh my God, even more precious than Why did you keep your best patients here? So that when our children walk by this street to the school every day, they know what the standard of the best is, they should do better. Open source standards of excellence. Which management book talks about it? It is this knowledge, this kind of institutional structure, which still generates urge to excel in our society, in different places. We need to share this spirit as much. So Honeybee Network contribution is not just finding technological solutions, but also institutional solutions, educational solutions, cultural creativity. A root bridge in Meghalaya takes 50 years to make. It lasts for 500 years. Why would a community invest two generations in making a bridge? Magnificent story. So that 20 generations will use it. So if two generations invest and develop a solution for 200, 20 generations, why not? Which is the activity in our life today? Which our, which, where the time frame is that long? I don't know of any, isn't it? So we must ask ourselves, our contribution should not be measured only in terms of technologies, only in terms of uh, solutions disseminated or discovered. We should also be, I mean, one should also ask us, what are the new values that you have discovered? What are the new principles you have discovered? What are the new heuristics you have discovered? What are the new metaphors that you have discovered? So which society can learn faster and become more responsible for longer future so that many, many generations ahead would still benefit from what we're doing today. Well, do you think that there's a, there's a big, you know, opening for um, CAPTCHA, you know, CAPTCHA, when you make an account, you have to basically uh, translate this, you know, small part of a book, which is basically what Google used to digitize, uh, you know, novels and nonfiction books. Do you think that um, there's there's big demand for a system in India where depending on each state, so each each language, they have to translate something from that language while making an account or while uh, that would be wonderful. I would be beautiful. I love it. I wish it happens compulsorily, not just voluntarily. I would wish that each one of us should pay a small rent, a small tax of knowledge, accessibility in our community, in our language. Because language and culture are very close. A language dies, culture dies. Languages must be kept alive. Languages must be kept alive through content which is contemporary in it, which is of recent origin, which is of great uh, interest and excitement to people. And that can come from other language cultures, by definition almost. So I think that's a great idea. I wish we should have done it years ago, decades ago. But it's a great idea. And um, do you think that 4G can be effective once government policies make makes compulsory education programs or compulsory education applications on the phones? Like, to really reach... I've been trying for the last 15 years. I made a grid of Central Board for Secondary Education Curriculum, one class 1 to class 12, all topics, all, sub all subjects, all topics. And I made two grids. So English, 1 to 12, all topics. Class 5, all subjects, all topics. Whichever way you want. It. And my goal is still not fulfilled. That different people can upload on, on each cell of the grid modules in different languages, in different media for understanding friction, for understanding gravitation, for understanding quadratic equation. So that children can then choose and whichever module they like well, they can download and learn. Plus, their teachers can do that. 
further if I want to go in physics to class 9 though I am in 7th but in math I am in class 5 though I am in 7th that's okay not all of us can be good in everything at the same time equally so people can decide parameterize how deeply they want to learn a subject and at what speed they want to grow in that subject which is not possible in the classical system of textbook of curriculum of a particular class in the class so don't peg my curiosity to class 5 or class 7 if i'm in class 7 few subjects i want to go up to class 10 let me go so there is a need for such content in indian or for the matter local languages around the world high quality content produced by the brilliant students those who have performed very well but we have not been able to do it yet so i don't know whether government will do that but it should do it it is required it is necessary but it has not done it as yet it should do it. do you think that india will be you know decided the future of india will be decided by the market or by the government neither the very fact that you ask a question about two choices itself has a problem because you have left the civil society unmentioned a lot of solutions will come from the civil society society which recognize the limits of the market and which recognize the limit of the state we know market failure takes place we know state failure takes place. we also know civil society failure takes place otherwise a lot of problems i am saying should have been solved by now so i'm not denying that there can be failure at all the three fronts but civil society is less constrained there are less limits on my imagination there are less barriers that i have to cross to talk to each other to create a small group of like minded people who will sustain my spirit if nothing else at least let me not feel depressed if i'm not succeeding that is very important you know to keep the spirit alive so i would say that uh, the great changes that will come in future will be when leadership will come from civil society and market and state will support it that to me is a truly speaking democratic uh, decentralized democratic development markets as i am seeing now are becoming more and more limited to adding more choices to existing consumers Isn't it? one phone has five feature i'll give you seven i'll give you 50 i'll give you 250 features but i will not give you content that no those who are out of the market can get into the market so for example if i have to ask and i did ask this question to the student to the morning when he was studying school how many of them have bought something made by hand by somebody in the last one month so i said what is the way in which money from my pocket will go to their pocket but they have bought everything that we produce this is what markets do they extract the real surplus that people have by selling them goods that they are producing i would say that surely but we meeting some need after all it's not that but are not fulfilling these social needs completely 43% children between the age of 1 to 5 are malnourished in my country in gujarat also which has the highest milk production but we don't keep milk for children we sell it off these kind of problem market cannot solve we have to educate the parents we have to help society understand keep little milk for the children feed them properly breast feed the child for at least 2 years or 3 years not just 6 months no matter what anybody advises or advertises right who will create market for breast milk to be fed by mothers to the children not by collecting milk and distributing mothers to be mothers to be encouraged to feed the child for 2 years 3 years the districts where we found no malnutrition among children were the ones where mothers breastfed their children for 2 3 years so it is possible in this country we have come across such regions in orissa and kashmir in manjagar haryana but how do i create a widespread awareness of this in the country that please mothers kindly feed your child for 2 3 years they will have more resistance to fight diseases they will be better they will be stronger to deal with these stresses of life in future they will have emotional satisfaction it takes bonding takes place to that process they will not feel impoverished in their spirit in their emotions they will have probably more respect for mothers hopefully so our society will be less oppressive to the women hopefully so i don't know but i think 
markets and state alone cannot be given the entire responsibility of running society. Society should itself take responsibility for running its own affairs through democratic action. So they should demand. They should demand the access or create it themselves. Because Mr. Mashakar says that, listen, we only need access in India. I cannot solve the income inequality in this country, but what I do believe we can solve is that as many people as possible can have access and therefore get tools that He is, a very, he is a very dear friend of mine and very respected friend and I respect him a great deal. But please understand, today people have access to the goods and services which, which poor people produce. A homemade pickle, a hand loom, a khadi and whatever else. It has not converted into purchase. If access was enough, then there should be enough demand for things that poor people produce. In which sense? Every sense. You need... I want money from my pocket to go to the pocket of poor. Which will happen when I buy things that they make. And I am not buying enough things from this they make. So the, what they produce goes at a throwaway price. What I produce gets premium. That is the problem. Access is not enough. We need access, assurance, ability and attitude. Four A's. All the four. If I have access to resources, but I don't have the skill, the ability to convert access into investment, my access is not worth it. Huh? If I don't have assurances that if I grow a small plant today, I'll be able to harvest it after 20 years, I will not plant it now. I need assurances. That's what institutions are for. Ability is technology to convert input into output. Access is what helps me to gain knowledge and resources. Attitude is what helped me to decide my trajectory. We need all the four. And that's lacking in the cert in certain areas in India and much, much more in certain areas than other areas. I have to go to class. Thank you. I'm really sorry, but I must rush. You can come to my class because I'm going to talk about innovation today. So if you want to join, the class today is on innovations. And I'm going to share the institution building aspect of the network. If you have some time and want to spend there, most welcome, because this is something that will be interesting. How did so many people get together to share their knowledge with us? That's the story I'm going to talk about. Why do people help us to learn so much? Why? We have not even given much to them, and yet they are sharing with us. Why are they sharing with us? So I will have to read really take leave, but I can tell you that what Honeybee Network has done is merely clean a little bit of the silt deposited in the river. We have deepened the river so that it can flow better. But the river was already there. It was flowing. We haven't created the river. We merely made the movement of water smoother and made the banks stronger so that it doesn't become a lake. River does not become Thank you. I have some time. So come over. Yep. Yeah? Yes. I'm going to classroom number three. Okay. And we will just go to class number three where students are waiting. And uh,